we started a movement called the Muslim Reform Movement, where in two pages we laid out that we as American Muslims, and also we had a summit that included Canadian Muslims and European Muslims, and we all signed the declaration and said, we reject all Islamic states, not just ISIS, but all of them. We reject the caliphate. We reject violent jihad. We believe in the equality of men and women. We believe that we stand against blasphemy laws, against apostasy laws, against the institutionalization of Sharia. So these things, there are Muslims that believe in a secular type government that believe in freedom, that are trying to get their voices heard. We have Saudi Arabia fighting a proxy war. We have Iran fighting a proxy war. Why does the American, why, why does the United States want to be a part of a proxy war, which seems to have two parts to it, okay? Russia is trying to gain and secure their influence in the Middle East for a variety of reasons, pipelines, oil, whatever you want to throw out there. But at the same time, we're still having that internal struggle, Shia versus Sunni. What, when is that going to get settled? It would seem that if we can work out the Sunni-Shia situation, a lot of other things may be more manageable. Actually, you know, I would tell you that it's you have. I agree with you, but it's backwards. And that the Sunni Shia thing is like Pepsi Coke, Coca Cola. It's two flavors of the same problem: political Islam. I wrote a piece in the National Review last week called "The Path Toward the Victory Against Islamism or Political Islam." So whether you're talking the Shia flavor of political Islam, which is Khomeinism and Hezbollah, uh, and by the way, Assad, who claims to be secular, is completely in bed tied at, you know, at the hip with the Khomeinists, so he's not exactly secular. Uh, or the Sunni version, which is the Muslim Brotherhood or the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, their both issue is theocracy. There's a certain feeling of helplessness, I think, for a lot of Americans because we don't know what to do. We, we don't know what to do. We're constantly being fed sources that um, or, or, or sources of information that reinforce the notion. And I want to get to this right now. Is it OK for Muslims to lie to people who do not believe in Islam? I mean, that 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 has come up and, and people have quoted the Hadith to me that it comes from. And yet. It's it's been disputed. It's it's just there's a level of distrust there because we don't understand. Well, that's not the Islam I learned. My kids, when I sit down to dinner with them every night, we say we say the same thing at our dinner table that we say and I say on national television. So, you know, pandering and lying to people, telling people what they want to hear, is not something Muslims have a monopoly on. Certainly, the theology that uh, tells Muslims, uh, and I'm glad you said hadith, because I will tell you that the vast majority of these types of corrupt practices, Hamas is a charter that says kill a Jew behind every stone. That is a, a quote supposedly from the hadith. Many of us believe that the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad was corrupted by the writings of so many tribal entities that said things and wrote things in the name of the Prophet that didn't even begin to be written until a hundred years later. So the majority of reform that has to happen, that's why we formed, you know, our organization now, our coalition called the Muslim Reform Movement. I'd ask people to go to that website, muslimreformmovement.org, and you'll see at the top of it a quote that we believe in. It says, ideas do not have rights, human beings do. And that's one of the biggest reasons the Islamic world has been stuck in the 12th century is that the, these governments prevent any type of questioning of what is thought to be scripture. We have to be able to have these public debates, and there's not been a a setting and platforms for that to happen. You know, in the United States, I would imagine it's it's uh, it's challenging, but not impossible for you to advocate for this. Are there other organizations around the world in in predominantly Muslim countries, the kind of um, theocracies that you are firmly against? Are there organizations, or is it too dangerous? Well, that's the issue. It's like the place where we have the best laboratory to do it, there's less motivation and urgency to do it. Right. The place, if you go to Egypt, where they are fighting against the Brotherhood, the reformers like Imam Ibn Zaid or Imam Shakawi or others who infected me, um, they're in jail, you know, or they, they died in jail. So, you know, al Sisi's of the world might give a great speech in front of Al-Azhar University last January saying how Islam needs reform and you guys have to take, you know, he was speaking in the belly of the beast at the Al-Azhar University, which mm -hmm. is basically the Vatican of Islam. And he said the right things about violence, but what he did not say, he did not mention the words freedom. He did not mention the word democracy. He did not talk about separation of mosque and state. He just wants a political Islam that doesn't have the violent underbelly that is run like a corporation 
or like a general runs the military, which is what he is. So they continue to be part of the problem because the oxygen is the same, be it a corporate political Islam of the royal families of these monarchs, or be it a grassroots viral political Islam of al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Muslim Brotherhood. So we have to somehow get American Muslims, and we have many organizations that form this Muslim reform movement. Uh, the Quilliam Foundation, based in London, signed on and put out a press release yesterday as joining us. In Denmark, a parliamentarian by the name of Nasser Khadr joined us in our summit, and he's in the Den Danish parliament. Uh, in Canada, Muslims for a Better Tomorrow, uh, or Muslims Facing Tomorrow, uh, um, joined us, and that includes Raheel Raza, who just did a documentary uh, on the uh, Honor Diaries, and uh, another documentary just came out called By the Numbers that looks at what's happening to minorities across the Muslim world. So there are many voices of reform. Azra Nomani, who you may have seen on Meet the Press a few weeks ago, has been really one of the leading voices in this reform movement. So there are many of us out there. The problem is is getting the attention and the bandwidth that, you know, we're up against sort of these billion-dollar corporations of governments that are feeding Islamic groups in America as the apologists for our community that really just want to put America on the defense. And I think it's time for America to go on the offense. Dr. Jasser, what can I do? I'm a white chick from the suburbs. What do I do? Can I do anything? Absolutely. We now have a tool that is really easy. Our Muslim reform movement has a two-page declaration with some of the things I mentioned in the last part of the hour. We, we took it to a mosque in Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, taped it on their door. They came out, ripped it down, and we had a conversation with them. I've had folks from Colorado, from Ohio, from Florida call us and say, you know, we don't know any Muslims, but we're going to take that declaration to our local Muslim community and ask them what they think. Now, there's a lot of reforms that have to happen for Muslims to get to the point on that declaration, but it's the goalpost. It's basically the, the principles that are the contract of society in America. And if Muslims believe those things, then they can begin to create institutions that will force our clerics to, to reform the ideas of our faith to get there. So use that declaration as the beginning of conversations at universities with your members of Congress on how to vet refugees, uh, with your uh, business leaders when they do interfaith work uh, uh, with churches and synagogues and mosques. Use that declaration as a starting point uh, to have a conversation about, well, do you believe in these principles? And if they tell you, well, we do in America, but in a Muslim-majority society, we would use the Quran as a constitution, that should raise red flags that these people are basically an insurgency versus those who say, well, you know, we believe in these principles and we're going to roll up our sleeves and start to, you know, get imams on board who will help us uh, uh, get these principles into the interpretation of Islamic law. It, as, uh, as I mentioned before the, the traffic break there, can the Reformation come from the West or does it need to come from the heart of Islam? Both. It's not going to, I think it's going to come from Muslims in the West that will be protected and given platforms by the most potent, strongest country on the planet. America cannot lead it. You're right. The president cannot become a theologian in chief. But America's founding principles were about pushing back against theocracy, and we can take sides within this battle in the, you know, within the House of 